Next, we're going to have Facebook join us. Um, we've got Shri from Facebook Audience Network. Uh, hopefully, Shri will join us uh, uh, shortly. So he's going to talk to us about uh, how to um, monetize mobile games in uh, 2021. For me, um, I'm finding I'm increasingly using uh, Facebook kind of ads to essentially do my testing and, and, and prioritization of games as we're getting them ready to go live uh, so that we know which games are worth, you know, not worth, but are going to have the potential to be successful. But obviously growing that and monetizing that over time is going to be a different thing. And that's why I'm really keen to see what Sheree has to talk to us about. So Sheree, how are you doing? Hey, Oscar, doing well, how are you? Not too bad, not too bad. I'm going to hand over to you. So uh, I'll keep my mic open just long enough. So if you've got slides, I can tell you they're working. Uh, cool. But I will hide my face because people see enough of me. Let me just start screen sharing. Uh, so uh, I guess to, to start off, hi, everyone. Thanks so much uh, for the time. As, as mentioned, uh, I work at Facebook Audience Network, uh, where I'm a strategic uh, partner manager. Uh, and today, uh, I'd love to give you all four key tips uh, for how to drive monetization growth in 2021. Uh, so kicking off the presentation, before we get started, uh, a quick intro for anyone who isn't familiar. Facebook Audience Network uses Facebook Demand to help publishers monetize their mobile apps uh, using high performance ad formats, including rewarded video and interstitial ads. Uh, and also one quick plug uh, before we get started. Uh, my colleague Alicia will be giving a talk tomorrow uh, on Facebook login, which I highly recommend everyone uh, attend as a follow up to this session. Uh, and my colleague Chloe Gingrich also gave a talk yesterday, I believe, which is available on demand. Uh, so please check those out uh, if you haven't already. So jumping into today's uh, talk, uh, I think it would be impossible to speak about ad monetization uh, in 2021 without, you know, first addressing the, the upcoming changes uh, with iOS 14. As many of you will know, uh, late last year, Apple announced uh, that beginning with iOS 14, app publishers would be required to collect permission through their app tracking transparency framework uh, in order to access a user's IDFA. Uh, this change was hu huge news for ad monetization as typically IDFA had been the identifier used by ad networks uh, in order to serve people personalized ads. Uh, the most recent news from Apple is that uh, apps will be required to obtain permission to track users starting in early spring of this year. So while we still don't know, you know, the exact date when these changes will, will come into effect, uh, the expectation is in the, the next few months, we should start to see the, the impact of these changes. Uh, Facebook, we, we've released a number of public statements on uh, our position. Uh, and one thing we, we've been clear on throughout is that we expect, you know, these changes to negatively affect app publishers' ability to, to monetize their iOS apps. Uh, publishers should expect to see lower CPMs from audience network as, as well as likely other ad networks uh, as a result of these changes, uh, as it becomes more difficult for advertisers to accurately target and measure their campaigns. Um, and it's important, I think, for, for US app publishers to understand this uh, heading into those changes, uh, just so you're able to you know, plan and, and prepare effectively. Um, so with all that said, uh, there are steps you should already be taking uh, in order to ensure you're in the best place possible uh, heading into to these upcoming changes. So uh, I'll speak specifically to, to audience network and, and things that you should be doing right now. Um, but really you should consult with each of the ad networks you use to understand uh, what their recommendations are uh, as you prepare for, for these iOS 14 changes. In terms of audience network specifically, uh, basically there, there are three things uh, that you should be doing right now. Uh, so first, update your SDK to our, our latest SDK version 6.2.1. Uh, and if you're using mediation, as, as I, I imagine many of, of the publishers uh, listening to this talk are, uh, make sure the adapter you're using is updated to the latest version compatible with SDK 6.2.1. Uh, secondly, implement what we call a set advertiser tracking enabled flag. Uh, this is unique to, to Facebook. Uh, and basically, it's a flag that, that allows us to understand whether or not we should be serving personalized ads to a user. You can go on Facebook's uh, developer website uh, for more info on, on how to implement this flag. But this, this is the second requirement 
as far as audience network is concerned. Uh, and lastly, uh, add our suggested SK ad network IDs uh, in accordance with Apple's uh, requirements. Uh, so again, these are, are specifically the, the three things you should be doing to prepare for iOS 14 uh, as it pertains to audience network. But as mentioned, consult with uh, each of the ad networks you use to understand uh, the, the steps that they require. So clearly 2021, uh, it's going to be a, a year full of challenges, but the news isn't all, all doom and gloom. Uh, what's really encouraging is that even in spite of, you know, the expected IDFA loss, uh, analysts are still very optimistic about the future of, of mobile gaming and in-game advertising. Um, on screen, you can see quotes from analysts who are, are quite bullish on, on the future of in-game advertising. And I think uh, what's especially notable is, is that first quote uh, from Guillermo Escofet, who's an analyst at research from Omdia. Uh, he predicts, you know, even despite the, the new I, IDFA changes, uh, ad revenue should grow to 183 billion uh, in 2025. So in terms of being a, a mobile games publisher dependent on ad, ad revenue, uh, there's still quite a lot to be, be excited about when you think about the future. Uh, so with all that said, what, what should you be focusing on uh, in 2021 to help uh, drive monetization growth. Uh, and the first topic uh, I'd love to cover today is, is bidding. Throughout the last year, uh, bidding has gained increasing momentum. Uh, more publishers, demand sources, mediation platforms, and the wider ad tech ecosystem have adopted bidding uh, as their preferred approach for ad monetization. And really, there, there are two key reasons why we've seen this. First, bidding has helped has proven to help publishers increase their revenue. Uh, when every demand source bids in an open and, and fair real-time auction, you see more competition for your inventory, uh, which means better prices for every impression. Facebook actually uh, put together a report on, on how app bidding is transforming businesses. And, and one thing we found was some businesses saw as much as a 27% increase uh, in ArpDAO as a result of making the move to bidding. Uh, so the revenue impact is quite clear. Uh, but more than just that, publishers also report reducing their time spent on ad operations by up to 50% uh, as a result of, of moving to bidding. And, and this is huge. Um, you know, by removing the burden of having to, to manage a complex waterfall, it frees up your team to focus on other key areas of growth, uh, which can be really huge uh, for any mobile games publisher. And we've seen, you know, the impact of, of bidding firsthand with some of the publishers we work with. Uh, on screen now, you can see a, a case study that Audience Network put together with, with Voodoo. Um, basically, Voodoo, we're looking, you know, as many publishers are, to increase their ARPDAO uh, and also reduce the time spent on, on waterfall maintenance. Uh, as a result, they A-B tested bidding. And the results for them were they saw a 12% increase in ARPDAO and a 10% reduction uh, in time spent on, on ad operations. Uh, and what was especially encouraging for us to see was, uh, you know, following this A-B test, they decided to move all their apps over uh, to bidding, uh, which really speaks to, you know, what an impact it can have on, on a business. Uh, on screen, you can see a quote from their uh, UA and monetization team lead, David Ribeiro, where he mentions, you know, the ARP DAO uplift they saw uh, and the fact that they've now moved over all of their inventory to bidding. Uh, and what's even more encouraging when it comes to bidding is, is seeing the impact it has on publishers of all sizes. Uh, on screen now, you can see a, another case study we've put together with a, a studio called Lucky Cat, Lucky Cat, uh, based in the Netherlands. They're a smaller team of, of around 20 people, uh, but like Voodoo, they, they were facing the same challenges, wanting to increase ARPDAO, wanting to reduce time spent on ad operations. They too tested bidding, uh, and the results for them was they saw a 20% increase in ARPDAO uh, and a reduction on time spent on ad operations by uh, six hours a week. So, so six hours less spent on ad operations each week, uh, which is huge, especially for a, a smaller agile team. But beyond just the, the revenue and, and, and the time savings benefits offered by bidding, um, there's also an iOS 14 impact to take into consideration. Uh, our expectation is once these iOS 14 changes go into effect, waterfalls will become even more inefficient and, and even more complex to manage. Basically, what we expect to happen is a, a two-tier system to be created, 
where you have some users who have opted in to sharing their IDFA and, and receiving personalized ads, uh, and others who have opted out, uh, and as a result, will be receiving uh, won't be able to to receive personalized ads. Um, in this system, it becomes even more difficult to to manage a waterfall, uh, and bidding is really the only way to ensure you're getting the maximum value for every impression you're serving. So for all of these reasons, the, the revenue impact, the time savings impact, uh, and the iOS 14 impact, it's so crucial uh, for, for you to move to bidding today uh, if you haven't already. But beyond bidding, uh, the next topic I, I'd, I'd like to cover is uh, hybrid monetization. The changes coming with iOS 14 have shown us the importance of, of hybrid monetization, which is uh, basically a strategy of using both ads and in-app purchases uh, to monetize your game. On screen, you can see some of the partners we work with who already are, are, are utilizing the value of, of hybrid monetization. By driving revenue from both ads and in-app purchases, you as a publisher are able to drive the maximum LTV from your, your users, uh, which makes you much more resilient to any changes in uh, UA costs that may be coming due to, to, to the upcoming iOS 14 changes. Uh, and you know, if, if you're a publisher right now and, and, and you're not already using hybrid monetization, what, what should you be doing? Basically, if, if you're a, a publisher, a hyper casual publisher, totally relying on ads, at this point in time, you should be thinking about, you know, how can you add depth to your game uh, and integrate ads and in, uh, IAPs, uh, excuse me, in a meaningful way. And on the flip side, if you're an IAP publisher who uh, doesn't use any ads in your game, test ads in, in, in your game with the understanding that, you know, 95% of users will never make an in-app purchase. Uh, as you can see on the slide, research has shown fewer than 5% of users will, will, will ever make an in-app purchase in a game. So using a combination of both ads and in-app purchases is the best way to ma maximize uh, monetization and, and the LTV you're driving from your user base. But beyond uh, hybrid monetization, it's important also to think about the sort of ads you're using in your games, uh, which is why I'd like to, to speak a little bit about rewarded video. You know, one year ago, um, some publishers still needed to be convinced that that rewarded video would not hurt their game. Uh, in 2021, players of all genres that will, will, will come to expect rewarded video in the games they play. Uh, Facebook actually recently commissioned a, a report on rewarded video, uh, which had some really interesting findings. Uh, specifically, we found 32% of users uh, actually find rewarded video to be the, the format uh, that is twice as useful as all other ad formats. Uh, and the reason is, is because they actually are able to get something uh, in game as a, a result of, of using rewarded video. There's actually a value exchange happening. Uh, and moreover, uh, what was interesting was a, a study that I, IDC uh, did, uh, which showed that actually 71% of hardcore gamers like or are okay with rewarded video, um, which is really huge. It, it shows, you know, sentiment actually is quite positive towards ads. Uh, it just depends on, on the sort of ads that you use in your games. And that 71% figure, it, it makes sense, especially when you think about, um, you know, just the way games work. Uh, the vast majority of your users, you know, want to unlock content quicker in the games they're paying. Uh, but they're very unlikely to ever make an in-app purchase. Rewarded video gives them this alternative way to continue playing your games, unlock content quicker, uh, while still generating significant revenue for, for you as a publisher. And it's not just, develop, uh, and it's not just players, rather, uh, that like rewarded video. Developers uh, agree rewarded video is beneficial to their games. Over 79% of developers surveyed say that rewarded video is actually their most successful format and that it can help with in-game metrics like retention and also even encourage in-app purchases. Um, on screen, you can see quotes from, from develop, developers who use rewarded video in, in their games. Uh, and what's clear is, you know, sentiment is quite positive. Rewarded video can work. Uh, it's just about implementing it uh, in the right way. So for you as a publisher, you know, what should you be thinking about when it comes to rewarded video? And, and really there are three key things to, to remember. Uh, at Facebook, we call them reward, placement, and design. Uh, but really what, what you should be thinking about is, you know, the what, where, and how. 
what do players receive as a result of watching a rewarded video? Where should you be inserting your rewarded video ads in your game? And how do you get players to engage with, with the rewarded video that you put in your game? The right combination of these three things uh, will lead to the best engagement rates possible with your rewarded video units uh, and will also ensure that you're driving maximum revenue um, from ads in, in, in your games. So moving on uh, to the last topic I'd like to cover today, uh, and that's instant games and, and cloud games. In terms of uh, you know instant games and, and cloud games, I, I think the last year has shown us that policy changes can lead to incredible volatil volatility and uncertainty. Uh, and the more diversified your business is, the better equipped you are to deal with new challenges uh, as they present themselves. Uh, with this in mind, uh, let's talk a little bit about instant games and, and cloud games. So for those of, of you who don't know, instant games are, are games that can be played directly in the Facebook app uh, and don't require any downloads at all. Uh, as instant games are HTML5 games, they're general, generally very quick to develop. Uh, and as the games are hosted in the Facebook app itself, players can easily connect uh, and share games with friends, allowing them uh, to go viral and, and reach a massive audience. Uh, and here on this screenshot, you can see, uh, you know, what the, the UI looks like, how uh, players can access instant games uh, directly from the Facebook app itself via our, our gaming tab. Uh, really, the, the point I, I want to make with instant games is uh, specifically, you know, if you're a, a publisher who's making games that are already social in nature, more casual, um, instant games really are, are a platform you, sh you should be exploring um, because it, it does offer just a, an entirely new revenue stream uh, and an ability to, to uh, utilize Facebook's massive audience. But beyond instant games, uh, if you're a publisher that has games that are a bit more complex with a bit deeper gameplay, uh, Facebook also announced late last year uh, the ability to publish cloud games with Facebook. Cloud games similar to, to instant games are uh, native games hosted and streamed by Facebook. Uh, and like instant games, they're playable instantly on, on mobile web and on mobile and web uh, and don't require any downloads. Um, so I, th I think another exciting opportunity um, publishers should, should be considering. And really, as mentioned, you know, the, the value in instant games and cloud games is the ability they both offer to leverage Facebook's massive audience. As you can see from the slide above, uh, 700 million people uh, are engaging with games on Facebook today. Uh, so it's really worthwhile for you as a publisher to be considering publishing to both of these platforms uh, as the revenue potential is, is, is quite significant. And in terms of monetization, as, as obviously that's key, uh, both instant games and cloud games uh, can be monetized using ads, using audience network, uh, as well as in-app purchases uh, on Android and, and, and mobile web. So to recap uh, and just kind of bring everything together, uh, here are the key things uh, you should be focusing on. Uh, in 2021 to, to drive monetization growth. First, as mentioned, uh, in preparation of the changes coming with iOS 14, uh, as it pertains to audience network, update your SDK, enable the set advertiser tracking flag, uh, and uh, include our SK ad network IDs uh, per Apple's requirements. Beyond that, as you look to you know grow revenue, uh, move to 100% bidding as it's proven to increase revenue and also reduce the time your team spends on ad operations, uh, use a hybrid monetization model using both ads and in-app purchases to drive the maximum LTV from your user base, use interactive ad formats like rewarded video, as it's been proven that users actually you know, like engaging with these formats, uh, and lastly, uh, launch instant games and test cloud games uh, as they can offer an entirely new revenue stream, um, which can be uh, huge for, for your businesses. So with that, I'll, I'll wrap it up and, and I'll pass it back to Oscar uh, to, to take back control. Thanks, Serena, that was great. Uh, and I think that you've hit on some really interesting stuff for me as well, particularly because um, I, I uh, 
was the uh, original evangelist for a well-known rewarded ad network. Uh, I think I was probably the first pe person to sit down with a developer on a stage and talk about how to place rewarded ads properly and effectively, uh, which was the guys from uh, Hipster Whale. So, uh, you know, we were talking about Crossy Road, Matt Hall and I at a, uh, I think it was a Casual Connect uh, in, or maybe a White Nights, I'm not too sure. I think it was a Casual Connect in um, Amsterdam. Feels like a long time ago, uh, probably about six years. Uh, that was great stuff. I understand that you've got to head out because you can't take questions. Um, so really sorry for everybody who wants to ask questions. I'll try to answer some of them. Um, hopefully I can uh, I can do that for you. Uh, but Shreek, thank you, thank you so much for that. Really good stuff. Yeah, um, in, in, the, um, in the particular question, so we've got a couple of anonymous questions raised here. So one of them is, for a hyper-casual game, would a broad audience targeting in Facebook also bring IAP players in proportionately? Um, I, you're using a couple of uh, acronyms I'm not familiar with, uh, VO and AO. Uh, maybe it's because I'm not a specialist in um, uh, kind of uh, ad uh, specific uh, elements. I'm a more of a generalist. But what I know from you know years of experience is that uh, essentially what you're doing in terms of identifying a, a, a paying as opposed to an ad viewing audience is more about the engagement of the player. It's a lot more effective to focus on the live operations of a game to be able to identify uh, and convert mm -hmm. users into paying. Um, the, the, the thing that we've, we've learned a lot about in the last few years is about how to use uh, rewarded ads effectively to, to identify the audience that wouldn't necessarily pay, but also to help communicate the value of your in-app purchases. So smart planning and targeting and, and placement of ads is as important as communicating the value proposition of the uh, the IAP items in itself. So um, I did a few lectures on this sort of stuff. Uh, in fact, I'm, uh, I'm going to be running a masterclass on how and when to save a failed game shortly. Um, with the Pocket Gamer guys, and I will be covering some of those elements about monetization design in that masterclass. If anyone's interested, obviously, please feel free to shout. Um, so uh, another anonymous um, um, person talks about why does hyper casual games use interstitial more? There's a really fascinating thing, for me anyway, about why that happens, and that's because of the instance of frustration. I know it sounds uh, a bit weird, but what I'm saying is in a hyper casual game, we have this intensity and we need a moment of relief. Because hyper-casual games are simple, they're very easy to go back to back to back to back. So what actually happens with an interstitial is it forces the player to pause whilst an ad is played. What that does is it creates a moment of relief and prevents burnout. So that counteracts the negativity that you often get with an interstitial in a more casual or a more hardcore game, which interrupts the flow. So the fact of interrupting the flow in a hyper-casual game is actually a positive uh, for a hyper-casual game, in my opinion. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, so that hopefully also answers why, uh, you know, it's, it's therefore used more often. Um, Android CPMs will increase more as UA budgets go to Android. Um, that's not necessarily the case, but it's probable. Um, I'm not going to make judgments calls over where the trends are because I'm often, you know, um, I'm not very good at forecasting what happens with market, but I would expect we're in a very interesting situation right now. Um, the the negative impact in terms of brand advertising, in terms of the you know the COVID crisis and so on and so forth, although that has had positives as well. Um, so we're in a very very messed up time to try and work out any predictive prediction. So. Um, I'd love to be able to give you a, a thought on ECPMs. My feeling is that uh, things are just going to be more complicated and we're going to have to find our way through it. I know it's not much of an answer, but hopefully at least uh, I'm kind of expressing the complexity that's going on right now. Um, how can you be part of cloud games being a small indie? Well, there's lots of different ways that you can use uh, cloud elements. Uh, there are uh, platforms out there which are looking for content. Um, there are also uh, tools essentially where you can use cloud technology to deliver elements within your game. Um, but uh, it's probably too big a conversation to uh, kind of have in terms of general stuff. But I think what the um, uh, what Shree was talking about with Facebook was basically utilizing their instant game model. Uh, and um, obviously that's something, you know, go look up on what Facebook are doing with instant game. I'm, I'm not going to be able to start, fortunately. Um, but what I hope, 
you ta- well, what I've taken from Sri's talk, which I hope you guys have as well, um, is that there is a, a, a really kind of interesting time that we're in, uh, you know, both in the sort of um, the curse and the, and, the, and the positivity of that, the opportunity of that. So as we are facing all these changes and all these cultural environment changes that's happening into the industry, we're having to think more about the connectivity of the gamer and how we monetize them. Whether it's from Mika's talk about how we can look for other platforms, how we can look at payment mechanisms, you know, for uh, web-based content, whether we're looking at the Facebook ad mechanisms, where we're looking at in-game IAPs, what we're having to think about is where is the value for the player? Where is the utility? Where is their lifestyle fit? And actually, I think this is increasingly about how do we think about retention? Because the biggest driver for revenue is when you can get more players doing more things more often and for longer. That's how we're going to be able to scale games. And so understanding the value of hyper casual to be able to identify amazingly fast, rapid mechanics and monetize through this simple kind of interstitial ad mechanism and how we can then transition those game mechanics into things which are more sustainable over time. So that's kind of how I look at things. Uh, hopefully that will make sense. Uh, I'm very happy to take you know, further questions on that, but obviously I'm not a speaker, I'm merely a host. So uh, you know, don't let me get in your way.